how does even like the dietary aspect or even like you know neuroinflammation if you want to call it that gut brain axis how much does that play into uh, mental health anxiety depression or do you think it's vice versa where anxiety stress depression leads to you know this kind of heightened response do you know what i mean like chicken or the egg chicken or the egg right exactly like how you know what are what are your thoughts on yeah so i i think a few points to kind of before i dive into what my kind of clinical appreciation of it is is that there are 80 percent of nerve fibers going from the gut back up to the brain so majority of the communication is happening up up wow from the bottom up, not the top down. 80%. 80%. And so what are the things that are being communicated? Well, number one, direct inflammatory molecules are being produced in the gut that are now making their way up to the brain. Neurotransmitters. So the gut produces 90% of your serotonin. Mm-hmm. Serotonin is the major neurotransmitter targeted by all your antidepressant medications. Mm-hmm. So we are trying to keep serotonin in the synaptic cleft, in mm-hmm. the neuron, mm-hmm. between the neurons longer, where we are not looking at where is it being produced. Mm-hmm. Could be a gut issue. Right. Uh, so I would say that things like anxiety, depression, it's probably a little bit of column A and column B. It's thought processes, it's a mentality. It's we perceive every single stressor through our senses mm-hmm. and then basically the brain is deciding can i cope with it or can i cope with it mm-hmm. and if it can't then it you trigger into the stress response and then that can actually cause permeability in the gut and then that permeability increases inflammation and then we have good research coming out that depression is an inflammatory condition mm. there is the inflammatory theory of depression mm-hmm. and I, I would put all kind of mental health uh, conditions into that category. They just haven't been as studied as well as depression. Right. So I think it's it's a combination of, of both. And then you can also look at, you know, could a person's intestinal permeability that could have maybe been caused by a brain injury then led to depression because now all this inflammation is being produced and they are not able to resolve it? Totally. Right, right, right. right. So it depends on what the initiating stimulus was. Right. Now is all of that gut-brain axis, you mentioned that 80% going back <clears throat> 20% going out is all of that vagus nerve is that is that bidirectional or is it vagus nerve in something else out like right. how does it communicate back so for those of you that don't know the vagus nerve is the main connecting point between the central nervous system your brain and your basically your whole abdomen and thoracic cavity so all your organs your gut is the one of the major organs there in your abdomen it's the main connection point between <clears throat> the basically the communication coming down from the brain. However, it also has communication to the rest of the body and to the brain as well. But that other communication I'm talking about with that 80%, those are things that are also independent of the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve has an ability to have an anti-inflammatory effect. And this is something I lectured a, a lot about last year in the naturopathic circles. But what researchers found is that when you are in a constant sympathetic overdrive, and that would be probably the, the biggest takeaway that I see with all my brain injury patients, and you probably can attest to this, mm-hmm. they are in a state of over being overstimulated, over anxious, they mm-hmm. can't sleep. All the symptoms that you'd experience if you're in that kind of fight and flight mode, mm-hmm. but they have it on like an everyday low grade. Yeah, I'm always just, I'm never rested. I can never get into like... And then symptoms of that are like anxiety, I can't sleep, my mind is racing. And ultimately, you can't recover because sympathetic nervous system cannot be activated at the same time as parasympathetic. Parasympathetic is your vagus nerve. Mm. So if you are constantly in sympathetic mode, you are down-regulating, shutting off the vagus nerve. Just the way that the, the, the central nervous system is set up. When the autonomic nervous system, one branch is sympathetic, the next branch is parasympathetic, it comes out of the brain at the locus ceruleus. You can't have both turned on at the same time. Mm-hmm. So if you're always, if the body's like, I'm in like fight or flight mode, I'm in survival mode, it's just going to prioritize sympathetic. Right. And it's going to basically shut down all this. And what does that shut down? All the secretions of your enzymes, your hydrochloric acid in your stomach. So that means you're not breaking down food. You're not able to absorb any nutrients. You're now getting undigested food particles lower in the intestines. Your gut bacteria starts fermenting those, producing... Uh, molecules, chemicals that cause bloating. They can be systemically absorbed that have a systemic peripheral effect. 
food sensitivities increase. A lot of the food sensitivities that I see in my patients, there are what I call primary food sensitivities and secondary, meaning probably ones that you genuinely have a food sensitivity to. And then there are ones that are just your gut's leaky and your immune system seeing all these things. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that when I look at a food sensitivity test that you can test for in your blood, everything is red. Yeah. And we talked about that, right? We looked at that with yours. Even. Yeah. But that was like, okay, we know that you can't eat things like eggs, mm -hmm. but all these other foods I think are just like bystanders. But even the egg thing, the egg thing for me didn't come on until I was in first year chiropractic college. I eat eggs my whole, my whole life. And so even then yeah. that may have been a stress response too, right? To Could being in like just I remember how school, with medical school, was super stressful. It's crazy, sure. right? Like it's yeah. crazy. So, um, that's like, that's super, super interesting because what I notice, especially with a lot of my patients is yes, they are in like fight or flight. If you're to do like resting heart rates and stuff like that, like their morning resting heart rate is off the charts. When, even when I sit them down to do their treadmill test, they're already, their heart rate is above what you'd expect. And they might just be nervous about the test, but I notice that they're in that sympathetic, uh, kind of fight or flight all the time. And then what I also notice is one of the symptoms they always describe, not always, but very frequently describe is that they have like their stomach is upset. They have low grade this, nausea. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes. And probably half the people listening to this right now are going, that's, <laughs> that's me. me. Yeah. Right. That's me. And, um, it's, I, so I, so I've been referring a ton of patients to you just because of that, because it's like, okay, there's something going on here, chicken or the egg. I'm not really sure. And so I'm trying to do what I can to try and, um, educate, you know, give them different tricks and tools they can use to calm that down, you know, um, in terms of thought process mm -hmm. and like mindfulness and things like that.